This is the introductory video for the moment of inertia experiment. Okay, this is the basic apparatus that we use. We've got a platter that spins, and on top of that we've got this picket disc object. The picket disc is going to trigger a photo gate, and then in conjunction with a program that I'll show you later, you can determine the angular acceleration of this disc. So what I mean is, you may have a tr bit of trouble seeing this over here, but there's a string, and it winds around a little step pulley underneath, which I'll show you and it goes over a pulley on the edge of the desk, which is attached to a mass hanger. So I dangle the mass hanger on the string over this pulley, and then I can wind up the string on the pulley that's on the underside of the apparatus. And once I've done that, I can then release the disc, and it will start not just spinning, but actually accelerating. So you'll be measuring the angular acceleration of this disc later. Now the nice thing about this apparatus is that we can stick any object on here and measure its moment of inertia. We could put a fish on here and get its moment of inertia. The apparatus doesn't care what's sitting on it. The only problem with this apparatus is that it has a moment of inertia also. So even when there's nothing sitting on top of it like this, if we take a measurement, we'll get a moment of inertia that's just due to the apparatus itself. So to get the moment of inertia of whatever object we're interested in, we're going to have to take two readings. We're going to have to put the object on here, wind up the apparatus, run it, get our moment of inertia, and then take the object off, wind it up again, do a second run of just the bare apparatus, and then subtract the value we get from that off of the first value we got. So I'll show you on screen what I mean by that. So on this screen, I stands for moment of inertia. So I load means the moment of inertia of the load, which is the object that we're interested in getting the moment of inertia of. We want this quantity, the moment of inertia of just the object as if it was spinning in empty space. But we can't get that directly because the apparatus, the system, also has a moment of inertia. So as I said, you're going to have to take two measurements. One of them is just the bare system, so the moment of inertia of just the apparatus with nothing sitting on it. So you would do this once. Then you'd place the object that you're interested in on top of the apparatus, and you'd measure this quantity, the system plus load moment of inertia. And then you subtract the moment of inertia of just the apparatus from the moment of inertia of this apparatus plus the load, and that gives you the quantity you want, the moment of inertia of just the load. Now to calculate I system plus load and I system, both of these use the same equation, and that's this second one down here. So you'll be measuring all of these quantities and calculating a moment of inertia, and that will be either this quantity here or this quantity here. So MH stands for the mass of the hanger, so the hanging mass. R stands for the radius of that step pulley on the underside of the platter. G is the acceleration due to gravity. This is MH and R again, same definitions as before. And down here is the angular acceleration, which you're going to be getting from the computer program. Now I'll just note that nothing in this equation changes except for alpha, this angular acceleration. So that hanging mass stays constant, the radius of the step pulley stays constant, gravity stays constant. The only thing that distinguishes this I from this I is that the angular accelerations will be different. So let's go back and look at the apparatus some more. Now before you begin, there's a few things you need to do to make sure that you get good data. One is that you need to level the apparatus. So you get a spirit level like this, place it on the base, not on the spinning part, but on the base, and then get your head so that you're looking straight down on this and make sure that the bubble is right in the center of the circle. If it's not, the little legs here actually have screws on them, so you can adjust the legs to level the entire apparatus. So do that quite carefully because it does show up in your data if you have not leveled everything correctly. Another thing you want to watch out for is that this string is not rubbing against anything. So squat down, have a look underneath the apparatus, and make sure that the string is coming straight off the step pulley that's down there onto this pulley without rubbing against the platter or the base. And finally, another thing to watch out for while you're squatted down looking between here is you want to make sure that string is winding up on the pulley and not on the spindle in the middle. So that's a very common problem you can have. So now I'm going to take this apart a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about when I say the step pulley on the underside of the apparatus. So you can pull this whole thing off, flip it over, and you see there's these three pulleys in there. So the string is going to wind around the smallest pulley, but there's actually three of them there. And like I said, you want the string wrapped around this pulley, not around the inner spindle, or else you'll get strange results. 
So before you put this all back together again, however, there's something that you need to measure. And that is, you want the radius of this step pulley where the string is going to be wound up. So to get that, you grab your calipers, close the jaws, turn them on, make sure they're on the centimeter scale, on the millimeter scale, and then you want to get the diameter in here where the string sits, and then divide by two to get your radius, which is the quantity you'll actually need in your calculations. So you get that, and once you have it, you can then reassemble the apparatus and get ready for data taking. Now depending on your lab instructor's preferences, you're either going to be measuring three objects once or one object in three different ways. The lab manual is actually still written up for the three objects, but some lab instructors do prefer to use just the single object. So if you're using just the block, what you'll be doing is you'll be measuring the moment of inertia with the block oriented like this, like this, and like this. So you do the experiment three times, just changing the orientation of the block. If you're using the three objects, then you would put each of these onto the platter, onto the apparatus, one at a time, and measure their moment of inertia individually. Regardless of which equipment you use, you're going to need to take some physical measurements off of these objects too. If you're using the block, you'll need to measure its length, its width, and its height. However, you'll have to be careful when you're doing the experiment to define things correctly. So for example, when it's oriented like this on top of the apparatus, this would be your length and this would be your width. When it's oriented like this, then this is your length and this is your width. And like this, that's length, that's width. So for each orientation, the definitions that you're going to use in your theoretical equations of length and width will change. But you will need these three dimensions for your calculations. You also need the mass of it, and likewise if you're using these guys, you'll need to weigh them, and you need to measure some dimensions for them. So with this block, again, it'll just be length and width. The vertical dimension is not going to be relevant. With the platter, you measure its diameter, and what you're actually going to want is its radius. So you just divide by two. And with the ring, you want the outer diameter and also the inner diameter. So the outer diameter and also the inner diameter. And again, both of those will get divided by two because what you're actually interested in for your theoretical equations is the radiuses. And I strongly recommend that you use a ruler, not calipers, to measure these things. The main reason is that there is a surface roughness on these objects and it's actually larger than the instrument uncertainty of the calipers. So since we have no good way to estimate what the physical uncertainty due to this roughness is, it's far better just to use a ruler and then you know what the reading uncertainty of a ruler is and that's all the uncertainty you would need for that measurement. So to take data, you would wind up the apparatus and then place the object that you're interested in on top of it in the correct orientation. You would start your computer program running, I'll show you that in a moment, and then you just release this and let it spin. The program will automatically start and stop, so you don't need to worry about that. With most of the objects, it's pretty straightforward how you put it on. You just slide it over the spindle, like so, but with the ring, it's a little more complicated. So in the picket disc, there are two small holes, and if you move those around, eventually you'll find that there's two small holes that match up with them in the platter itself. On the ring, there are two little posts, and those go in the holes. And once you've done that, you would take your data with the ring like that. So now let me show you the program that you're going to be using. So as usual, go into the Photogate VI's folder on your desktop, and you want to open up the Picket Fence program. Now there's a few things that you need to change before you can take data here. So first of all, it says intervals to time. By default, that's set to 10. Uh, in your lab manual, it actually says you should set this to 20. So let's move that up to 20. Second thing to change is it says edge to edge distance or angle, and that's set to five by default. Now what the edge to edge angle is, is the angle between the leading edge of one black stripe and the leading edge of the next black stripe on the picket disc. So just to be more explicit, this angle here between the front edge of one black stripe and the front edge of the next black stripe. 
So how do you actually measure this? Well, you don't have to. You should confirm this when you're in the lab. But the black and white stripes, if you consider them to be pairs, there are 10 pairs on the disk. So 360 degrees in a circle divided by 10 gives you 36 degrees. So this angle that you need is 36 degrees. However, the program needs you to enter the value in radians. So take 36 degrees, convert it to radians, and then that's what you'll enter in the program for your edge-to-edge -edge angle. So you fill in that angle in radians, 36 degrees converted into radians here, and then you should be ready to take data. So you would wind up your apparatus, add the load if you're doing one of those runs, and then you click the little white arrow, and you wait for this button down here to turn green. And once this is green, you can release the disk and let it start spinning, and the program will automatically start and stop itself. So I'll do that now. So I release the disk, and it is taking data, which you can see here. And when it gets all the data points, it plots them for me. Now what's being shown right now is an angle versus time graph. So the slope of this would give me my angular velocity but what I actually want is a graph of angular velocity versus time, because the slope of that would be angular acceleration, which is the quantity I want. So there's a button down here that will allow you to switch to that graph. Uh, there's just something glitchy about the program that you need to be aware of. So right in the middle of the button, there's this double-headed arrow, and if you click on the arrow, nothing happens. But if you move to any other point on the button and click it, then it works normally. So just be aware of that. Avoid the little arrow, because it doesn't work, but anywhere else on the button, We'll switch between the two graphs. Now when you get to the angular velocity versus time graph, you want to check that this thing actually looks linear. The program plots a straight line through your data regardless of how good or bad your data is, but if you have friction between your string and the apparatus, or your apparatus is not leveled correctly, it will show up in your data, and what it usually looks like is this sort of a sine wave. So the data will be wiggling around this straight line that the program has drawn. So take a good look at this graph and make sure that it looks pretty linear. If it doesn't, check your apparatus and try again. So if this looks nice and linear, then down here it gives you the acceleration, the angular acceleration. So this is the quantity you would write down in your book with appropriate units and uncertainties. What's the uncertainty? Go look in the apparatus section of the lab manual. It tells you what the uncertainty on these slopes are. So this angular acceleration is the quantity that you'll want. When you're ready to take more data, you can click Cancel. That gives you the white arrow back here. It also means that you can no longer switch your graph. So don't hit cancel until you're ready to take new data. But once you are, you hit cancel, and then you can click the white arrow and take a new set of data. And finally, the point of doing this experiment is that we measure the moment of inertia of the object or objects experimentally using the apparatus and then we're going to compare those values that we got experimentally to the values we calculate theoretically. So in your lab manual, they give you the three theoretical equations you use to calculate a theoretical value for the moment of inertia of the ring, the bar, the disk, or the bar in several different orientations if you're doing that. So these are the equations where you need the mass of the objects and, for example, the inner and outer radiuses of the ring. If you're only working with the bar, then just remember that the definitions of L and W will change as you change the orientation of the bar. And also do note that this 1 12th is not a typo. It is 1 over 12, not 1 half like the other two have. So you would calculate your theoretical values for the moment of inertia, compare them to your experimental values, and see whether you got agreement with an uncertainty.